start that. You know, what images are coming to mind? And you may find that you, you end up somewhere sort of stuck in the story. And there's a piece of the story where you find yourself dwelling, even though I may have moved on, that you're still dwelling on a particular image or a scene or something that happened. And that's totally fine. Just be there and know that whenever you need to catch up, you will, or maybe you won't, maybe you'll stay there. Um, and that's totally fine because that's, that's something obviously that your, your soul has taken a hold of and knows that there's some medicine in there for you. So trust that process. Don't feel like you should be doing anything or you need to be catching up or just, just to let it, let it be in your body the way that it, that it is. And this, with this particular story, I'm going to pause. So I'll pause probably two, probably twice. And then again, obviously at the end, um, just to check in with, with you. And there's, there's a lot of us, so we won't get a chance to hear from everybody, but I'd love to hear when I do pause, like what's landing for you? What pieces of the story are resonating? What is, what is working its way through your soul? And just, just to hear a little bit from people to, to reflect and, and, and reflect back what you're hearing. Um, any questions before I start? And feel free to just unmute yourself and, and jump in. So people are still arriving, which is, is fine. They'll, they'll catch up as we go. Um, so we're going to have lots of time to, to sort of process this story and think about it and digest it. But I'm going to I'm going to jump in. If everybody's ready. You look ready. It's hard to tell. <laughs> I think you're ready. So like it starts as all good stories do once upon a time. Once upon a time in a land far, far away in a time long, long ago, there was a beautiful kingdom up in the northern woods. And in that kingdom, in those woods, there was a castle. And in that castle, there was a king and there was a queen. And they lived happily and they lived well. All their crops were growing, their fields were ripe, all the sheep were gathered in where they were supposed to be, all the villains were thrown in the dungeons. All was well in the kingdom except for one thing. Well, one thing was that the king and the queen didn't seem to be able to conceive a child. And as the years passed, this brought a great sadness to the king and to the queen. And each night as they retired to their chambers, this sadness grew heavier and heavier on them until it started to permeate out of the castle walls and into the gardens and the, the vegetables started to, to wilt and die and the field started to produce less crops and the, the sheep started to lose their wool and the rivers run a little bit grayer and not so sparkly as they used to. And it was clear that this grief between the king and the queen was affecting the land. So one day one of the court members suggested to the king and the queen, well, maybe an adoption, maybe you could bring in a niece, a little girl, bring in some sparkle and some joy into the castle. The king and queen considered it and they said, okay, it's a good idea. Okay, that might lighten things up to have a little girl running through the halls. So Anise was summoned and into the castle she was brought and she had had the whole run of the castle. She could go anywhere she wanted and she was indeed full of joy and she'd skip around in the hallways, um, play with the goats, run around in the garden. And she brought some laughter to the court. She was gifted a golden ball beautiful shining golden ball and she used to go outside she'd love to go outside into the garden and play with this ball she'd throw it up and she'd catch it she'd throw it up and she'd catch it and her favorite place to go was out onto the edges the edges of the garden she'd take the ball out onto the very edges where there was a crusting of forest where the prim hedges meet the energy of twig and spell she loved that place. And she'd throw the ball up and catch it. And she threw the ball up and oh, it went over the hedge. And then whoop, it came back. She caught it. Wait a minute. What happened? She threw it back. And again, it came back. She caught it. This went on for some time until she plucked up the courage to look over the hedge. And there was standing another little girl. But this girl was not dressed in 
finery and robes and golden things as the princess was. This girl was dressed in tatters and was covered in mud and had bits of twig in her hair, but a sparkle in her eye. And she was throwing the golden ball back over the hedge, back and forth, back and forth, over the hedge, garden to forest, garden to forest. And the little princess was aware that standing behind this other girl, there was somebody else. She couldn't tell. Someone was watching. She was aware that dusk was starting to fall and she knew she must get back to the castle. So off she ran. And she arrived in the hall as dusk was starting to gather and the king and queen were seated. And she said, I have news. I have met a leafy girl who says her granny can make bellies swell like a browning loaf. She sings salt back to the ocean. She calls the owl to nestle in the lonely croft of your hips. Oh, said the king and queen. Well, that's interesting. Why don't you bring her in and see what her granny has to say? So the little girl ran out to the edge of the garden, peeked over the hedge, and, said, come, come. and she invited the, the tattered little girl and her granny into the hall. And the darkness is starting to gather now. The sun is setting. And the old lady seems a little reticent. The queen says, I hear you have information that may be of help to us. And she seems a bit shy, not really ready to talk. So the, the little girl with the twigs in her hair says, maybe some mead, that usually works. Pour her a glass of mead. And so the queen called a page to bring over some mead. And as the sun sank and the granny settled and drank her mead, she began to talk. She says, your bedroom, is it the top of that tower up there? Well, yes, right at the top. That's where our bedroom is. Well, we need to change that. You need to bring your bed down, drag it down the steps, drag it through the dirt, take it out to the stable, to the farthest stable, the one with the pitted earthen floor and lay your bed there. And tonight, my lady, wash yourself. Take two buckets of water and wash yourself, bathe your body. And then take that filthy water slopping down the steps into the stable and throw it intentionally on that dirt floor. Throw it in all four directions. Throw it on the earth. Make a big puddle mess. And then drag your puddle, your bed over that puddle. And in the morning, when you wake up, there will be two flowers underneath your bed. Under no circumstances, no circumstances whatsoever should you touch or eat the red flower. Do not touch the red flower. But pluck the white flower and eat it. And in nine months, you will have a baby. And with that, this hedge walker, this boundary straddler, this old hag, took up with her daughter and they cantered out of the hall just as the page was lighting the first candles of the evening. So the queen followed her instructions. What else did she have to do? She took her bed down to the stable. I think she actually got the servants to help her with the bed, but the bed was taken to the stable. And she did as she was instructed. She washed herself in the water and she carried that down and she splashed it in the four directions on the earthen floor. Her husband came along and then in the morning, she pulled aside the bed and indeed, growing out of that puddle of dirt, there were two flowers, one red and one white. Before she knew what had happened, the queen was on all fours and she had gobbled up the red flower. She just chomped it like a goat and she went, <laughs> And she ate the whole thing. She didn't know what had come over her. She looked around, nobody had seen. And there's the white flower, all prim and beautiful, growing. So she plucked the white flower. She ate the white flower as instructed. Okay, we're gonna pause here. Before we go on, I'd love to hear from anybody what's landed so far. What are you aware of? What's moving? 
in your body, what's moving in your mind, what images are sticking with you. Jerry, do you want to unmute yourself? At the very beginning of the story, with the opening of the castle, the king and queen, everything is fine. I feel stuck, like, no, <laughs> I don't buy that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a good setup, right? Because <laughs> nothing is ever fine. All of it's not fine. Yeah. Hmm. What else struck what you? What else struck you? I, um, I heard variations of this story. I'm so glad that I didn't know that this story would be this. And I'm always like, of course, she eats the red flower, but why? Why do we do that? And then I also have this part of me that's like, it's wrong, but it can't be wrong to do it. Like the way it unfolds is like, well, of course that's the way life is. So what is that? That like, yes. why do we get the warning not to eat it when it's our nature to eat it? And right. yeah, that right. part is the exactly. curiosity for me. Yes, thank you. Exactly. And that's exactly what we're dealing with here is these two sides of each of us. There's the, the prim and proper, the trimmed hedge in the garden and all the things are all organized and well. There's that side of us, which we've all been socialized into. And then there's the other side of us. What's on the other side of the hedge, that wild, untamed part that just gets on all fours and gobbles it up, even though we're not supposed to. There's those two parts creating tension in us all the time. Yeah, what else did you notice? Someone says, I think, Wendy says, I think the more warning makes us want to do it even more. Absolutely, I think we've all experienced that, right? When there's so many rules and regulations and shoulds and shouldn'ts, there's a part of us that wants to break out of that. Even if it doesn't seem logical, or maybe it's not even safe, there's a part of us that wants to break out of that, this part of us, this wild part that wants the freedom to gobble things up and run around in the woods barefoot with twigs in our hair. I wonder what would happen in a story in which somebody actually followed the advice of a being as advised, you know, like. Uh, it, it raises the question of like, how many of these beings in these stories are reliable narrators who are telling us truthful things? And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I personally don't know what happens in this tale. I imagine some others, you know, may not like, what if eating the red flower is a good thing or genuinely a bad thing? But what if eating the white flower is also a bad thing? Right, right. And as the story unfolds, we'll, we'll learn more, but exactly. You've got to trust your own intuition. And so what is the what is the balance between that, the domesticated self and the, the wild self? I'm seeing a bunch of things coming in the chat. I'm sorry I can't keep up with all of them. Somebody called John, who may or not actually be called John, said, I cried remembering the longing to have to be wild, dirty, and tattered again. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. This is a this story has really grabbed me because of that. I grew up on a a hill farm in Scotland where I got to run, literally run wild. You know, I was just out running all day. And at the same time, well, not the same time, but at different periods of the year, I was in a very strict English boarding school. So I grew up between these very polarized versions of domesticated and wild. And yeah, I very much relate to that longing to be running free and wild. Any other thoughts before we move on, see what happens with the queen? Okay. All right, so we're back in the kingdom <clears throat> nine months later. And indeed, the queen's belly has swollen. She is ready, ripe as a pear, ready to pop. And so all the women gather, the midwives and the doulas and the herbalists, and they all gather in the queen's chamber and there's much excitement. And they're holding this vision of this beautiful, perfect baby that's gonna come through and they're all excited. They've got the water and the towels and the candles and all the things and they're, they're all a, a clatter ready to receive this baby. And as the queen groans and screams and does the thing that women do as they're giving birth, 
What they imagine is not what is happening. A small goat hooves towards the sky, red cowled, sticky furred, a goat, and riding its greasy back is a tiny, hairy baby girl. A tattered hood shields most of its face, hanging limply and dripping. This deviant, this shape leaper, this terror nymph waves a wooden spoon and gallops the stage, relishing the screams. She has appetite, she's desirous, she's hungry for taste, she's hungry for meat. And she speaks. Be patient. Another comes. Twins. And all the ladies are a, cl are a clutter. What to do, what to do, what to do, what's this, what is this, what's this, go girl? Oh no, what to do, what to do? But before they can figure out what to do, the queen again is needing help. There's another one. And this time they see the crown of this little blonde head and out she comes, this perfect baby, little fingers and toes and blue eyes and cute squishy nose and she's this perfect little baby. There she is. They still couldn't figure out to do with what, what to do with the first one, this tattered hood girl, tattered hood, we're on her goat. So as best as they could over the next few years, the, the nurses and the nannies, they tried to put her away so she wouldn't be seen. They tried to put her in the attic and put her in the farthest reaches of the castle. But no matter where they put her, it didn't matter because the fair sister and her had such a bond that they would find each other. Their love was so strong that they would find each other. And as they grew, this tatterhood girl, this strange one with the goat and the spoon, she became quite an entertaining part of the court. People seemed to enjoy her. She had all these tales from who knows where, but around the world, these tales that would entertain them long into the night. And there was always raucous laughter when she was around and reticent as they were to admit it, the king and queen knew that the court was better off for her presence. And they allowed her to be there more and more. And as the girls grew, they began to ripen. And as was the custom in those parts, as the fair sister was ripening, they started to look for a suitor, for a husband for her. And a big feast was arranged in the castle and all the suitors from the kingdom were invited to show themselves and with the idea that one of them would be chosen as her husband. And they gathered in the vegetables from the garden and the fruit, and they bought in the meat and the mead and the wine, and they made a big feast. And on all the suitors and their families came into the castle. It was one cold winter's night, and they gathered together. And just as they were sitting down to eat, a groan, something you've never heard, something not from this world comes from outside the hall, a keening of many terrible things from the tree line beyond the locks and the mountains, come witch, come giant, come ogre. Horse leather drums beat the occult pace. Skulls of snow eagles shake atop roaring staffs. The butchers even cower at table. Everyone's afraid, except for Tatterhood. She is not afraid. She gets on her goat and she flies out the door. The tattered sister charges the unkillable throng. No one blocks her path. No one would dare. She is swift and the, with the death screech of an owl. Her fists rain daggers, hot landed on ghoulish heads, adrift in this fury that greets them. This tiny sister, this speck of joyous iron, the coven scatters, loses its mighty shape and starts a boozy retreat. Ha ha ha, said Tatterhood. I did it, I did it, I did it. And she gallops back into the hall. Um, everyone seems quite impressed. And the fair sister has been watching and she's curious and she sticks her head out of the window just to see if any witches or ogres or giants are left. And as she pokes her head out of the window, the last witch gallops past her, twists off her head, stuffs it in a crane skin bag and replaces it with the head of a calf and gallops off. <gasps> the queen screams, shatter the castle. The King stumbles and has to grab onto the wall. What has happened? The calf sister is on all fours. 
Tatterhood remains calm. And she says, this shape leap offers relief. Rather an animal power close by than the violence of unready love that was being prepared. As it goes, I make the sight, and I know where her head will go. But two blocks north, there is a longhouse of these hags. The head will be placed on a rusty nail. Me and my calf sister will take the foray. So the king says, well, we, we can send whatever you need, 10,000 men, horses, armor, weapons, whatever you need. She says, no, nope, I just need a ship, provisions, and my sister. And so it is agreed. The two girls, one with their calf head, will head north in the ship with the supplies. What's stirring now? Feel free to unmute yourself and just jump in. What images are sticking in your mind? What thoughts are running through? This quite ghastly event has shaken the castle. Just the beauty of um, two such different sisters completely, it seems like, at least the way it's landing for me is that they, totally love each other like they don't care at all about their mm -hmm. opposition their differences and they're just in it together and the rest of the world sees their differences and may place judgment on them but they don't feel that they are they're just figuring it out yes right exactly they're just twins they're just part of the same thing and they're moving through life as a as a pair yeah what else when the when the wild twin rushes through the crowd and out to fight the beast, um, just the the immediateness of that impulse reminds me of the red flower. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So we start to see the the thread of the wild twin. Right, as soon as that red flower popped up, something came over the queen. She acted out of character and against instructions and, and something grabbed a hold of her yeah and then here's this twin this baby girl that is acting from her own instinct from her own sensual being and uh is, is pulling that thread forward through the story yeah while well, the rest of the domesticated family are trying to hold it together and keep her under control but at the same time enjoying her raucousness and her stories and her laughter and what she brings to the court Will you repeat what Tatterhood says? Uh, better, she says, better a wild animal than better a wild nature than an unready love. Yeah, she says, this shape leap offers relief. This shape leap offers relief. Rather, an animal power close by than the violence of unready love that was being prepared. So a statement of that arranged marriage that was about to happen and that pushing of this young girl essentially into a, again a more domesticated life into a role into a box that's already been predefined for her where she doesn't have much choice the tatterhood sees this what she calls a shake leap this this change this sudden change in circumstances as she now has a calf head as a as a relief as a as a saving from being put in that box yeah so maybe think for yourself has there been times in your life where your wild twin the one inside of you has jumped up and saved you from that from being put in a box and funneled down a mechanical path that was chosen for you rather than chosen by you and what was that experience what was the, and, and maybe there's other experiences you can bring to mind of feeling like you could express the wild twin, that you could be that. You could operate from your gut instinct. And how does that play out in your life now? 
How do those two, the domesticated, the controlled, the got it all together, how does that balance with the wild twin who's wanting to run? Marianne says the twins are different aspects of the same individual. That's certainly one way to interpret this story. Absolutely, and on all stories. Valerie says through art making. Yes, that's a wonderful way to express that wild twin, that instinctual self. The wisdom of the wild twin was very revealing. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's in, inside both of uh, all of us. Both of that is inside each of us all the time. Um, and how we manage it then becomes the, the question, like which being conscious of in any given situation, which is the, which is the twin that I want to be leading the show here, which is the one that I want to step forth. And when does that wild one poke her head out, his head out? What are the circumstances that it seem to encourage that, whether wanted or unwanted <laughs> from the other side of you? Grace says the fair twin now has to follow those stirrings of curiosity or our call to adventure. Exactly, it's a calling. That's exactly what it is. The others thought she could move on to a new stage of life while skipping that step. Yes, it never works that way. You're totally right, Grace. Exactly. And that's as, as we're here in the Rites of Passage Council, that's exactly what we're talking about. There's this calling in every life. There's a calling and you may ignore it the first time round, but it's going to come back because it's your calling. <laughs> it's going to keep coming back. Um, <clears throat> presumably it won't be your head being twisted off and replaced with a cough, but who knows? There's a, there's a calling. There's something that's requiring you to take a different path than you are already on, than has maybe been prescribed to you, or you have just sort of prescribed for yourself, thinking this is the way that I should live life. And we are given this prescription, this culture of how we, how we should proceed. But a calling, exactly, some extreme event that changes things dramatically. Um, and that can look many different ways and, and looks different in every life. Um, but the archetype of that is that it's going to change your path. And that there's, and you can't skip that step, as Grace says, that there is something, there's some medicine in there, in that what seems like a tangent, this offshoot in a different direction, there's medicine in there that is required for you to get to the next step. You have to go find that, you have to go mine that medicine out from your soul in order to be able to successfully move on to the next phase of life, which we don't even know what that is yet, because we have to go through this, this initiation, follow this calling before we know what the next phase is. Mary says, I adore my wild twin. Yes, me too. I have a question. Yes. Anna. I'm wondering <laughs> I'm wondering why the ogres and the witches and all those fantastical creatures come rushing. Like mm -hmm. where do they come from and why? And if anybody yeah. has thoughts on that. Yeah. I'd love to hear if anyone has, else has thoughts on that before I jump in. I was thinking about that um aspect of how they came from the other side of the fence and mm -hmm. The ritual of scattering the water in four directions and it was very earth ritual you know it was very much all the all the spirits of the earth were saying well here are the conditions of this spell you know uh take the white flower not the red you know there's certain laws of reciprocity but in in, in nature and they kind of went well you took both so we're coming to claim something back because you agreed you know this was not the deal um, in a sense, and so they're coming and saying, well, we've created a natural law. We said you can have this child with the white flower, but not the red. Mm -hmm. you took the red, so we come to take something back. That's a law of nature, in a sense, you know, like the cyclic kind of nature of the four directions and like everything that symbol, the, the dragging the, red, the bed over the puddle and everything just all seem to symbolize very kind of earth grounded laws. And uh, if you're going to mess with them, then they're going to come and mess with you back. <laughs> that was kind of my take on it. Beautiful, Hazel. Yeah, absolutely. That that law of reciprocity. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that, on Anna's question? I um, see this in a way of, I was really inspired by that, Anna. And what immediately came to me was how there is this sense of urgency from um, the wild nature, the wild ones, or the 
the magical beings in stories um, to draw humans who have been so domesticated back to the hedge. Mm. Um, and sometimes when the moment is ripe, um, there's like this doorway that, that opens where the wind rushes in. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Eliza, and, and for bringing in the symbolism of the hedge as well. It's a very old symbol of the between, the betwixt and the between. The hedge is on the edge. It's between the two things, between the field and the forest, or between the field and the garden. There's the hedge, there's this thicket, this unknown, dark, tangly. I grew up with these hedges, like they're, they're everywhere on the farm I grew up on, and they're full of stuff rabbits and bird's nests and snails and slugs and moss and lichen and all sorts of stuff lives in the hedge and the hedge is for ancient ancient symbol of the between the liminal space that space that we can drop into between the unconscious and the conscious it's the subconscious it's the realm of the soul and somebody mentioned dragons up here i've lost it in the chat someone mentioned dragons but the dragons to me are the live in the hedge they live in that liminal space and they weave us these mythical beings weave us back and forth between the, the seen world and the unseen world any other thoughts on where these ogres and witches came from or any other thoughts speaking of that hedge i'm curious what happens to the little niece who started it all she just vanished now it's about somebody else yeah, well, well, we'll go through with the story and then you'll, you'll know. Um, uh -huh. But yeah, there's, a, there's more than one wild one in this story, for sure. I mean, the old hag showed up, right? She was, she was straight out of the forest, straight out of the hedge, probably. Yeah. Anything else that wants to be said before we move on? Find out what happens. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, so I, I'm answering the previous question, like yeah. what I took from that was, you know, somehow when we are trying to edge towards the perfection and keeping everything in, maybe the wild presents itself not as a an eruption of like stories and riding a goat and having this big personality, but it presents itself as a war, as an attack mm. when it does finally rear its head and um yeah and maybe that's that's perhaps why they they come in a band from the forest yes. so yeah absolutely yeah and i think that the more we ignore this part of ourselves this wild part of ourselves the more likely it's going to come like a wall as you said like an attack force because it's demanding our attention it's like hey you are not paying attention to me we got to fix this um, so the more we ignore it, repress it, push it away, the more likely it's going to come as a wall. And we often see that in our adolescence in this culture, because there isn't a lot of space or time for our, our young ones to express that wild part of themselves, because um, they're so scheduled and funneled. And, and so it will come out as something extreme, as a way to, to bring attention to that that wilder part of ourselves, that part that is instinctual, that is um, out from the earth, as you said, Hazel, that, that needs expression as well. And part of rites of passage, whether that's for an adolescent or, or at any other point in our, in our lives as adults, parts of rites of passage is being learning how to manage that so that the wild one is, is acknowledged and witnessed and expressed and honored and is able to be expressed in a way that is, is safe and is not harming others or harming self, but can become an integrated into the whole. So we have this way to, to be both of those things and to, to honor both parts of ourselves. And it's saying, so the ogres and witches, the entire forest and all its beings represent parts of our psyche. Absolutely, um, they can do, absolutely. That we are not one thing, as humans, no, none of us is one thing. We all have many different parts which show up at different times depending on either what gets triggered and some subconscious pattern pulls a part in, an angry part, a self-critical part, a compassionate part, um, or depending on the, 
on the circumstance as to what's called for. And part of going through rites of passage and, and parts of maturing um, is being able to recognize all these different parts that we have within us, because we all have them. Um, and pretending that we're one thing is just a farce. We're not, we, we, we have all sorts of different parts. And, and part of the maturation process is to be able to honor all those parts and make a conscious choice in each moment of which part do I want to be stepping forward? Which part will most serve me and the others here if I bring it forward now? Is it time for the wild twin or is it time for something more? more under wraps is it time for the critic or is it time for the artist like when is the what is required here and as part of that discernment process wendy says we're also in a time where we are re-remembering and our holy wildness is ripe to be expressed absolutely yes i agree with that um and yeah, the earth rituals and the water rituals and the rites of passage and, and even bringing these old stories back. You know, I'm so excited to see, what have we got, 56 people here. And some of you from the UK, I can hear your, your voices and so happy. Thank you for staying up late <laughs> to be with us. Um, but to see, you know, to see people wanting to be with these old stories is, is I think part of what, what you just said there, Wendy, that there is a, a re-remembering and a reclaiming and that's certainly been part of, of my journey is intentionally going after these stories, seeking them out and working with them um, as part of honoring my ancestral lineage and where they've come from, from and part of learning, bringing that medicine into my own life. I apologize if I didn't read your comment, but there's, there's a lot of them. Does anyone else want to say something before we find out what happens to these two? So they're in the ship. Tatterhood and her sister are in the ship. They've got plenty of supplies and Tatterhood knows where this longhouse is. I don't know how she knows, but she knows where this longhouse is, where these hags live. And so she steers the ship and they go north. And it's just two locks. They pass the first one, they pass the second one, and they pull in and she leaves her calf sister in the ship, jumps out on her goat waving her wooden spoon and off she goes. And she finds as she gets up to this long house, there's a big raucous party going on in there. These old hags are, I don't know where they got this mead from, probably from the cellars of the, of the kingdom, of the castle, but they're in there drinking it. They're having a grand old time and they don't notice as Tatterhood sneaks in a window, wraps her hand around and plucks her sister's head off that rusty nail. She tucks it under a cloak, canters on her goat back to the ship with a deft move, <laughs> turns off that calf's head, puts it back in a bag, and <laughs> puts her sister's head back on. Thank goodness. It's a little bit, a little bit wobbly, and a little bit, doesn't look so good. <laughs> Looks so good right now, but she's okay. The fair sister is okay. And uh, off they go. They get back in the ship. Tatterhood turns to her sister and says, dear one, we have done, I have done, as I promised to our parents. I have gotten your head back. And now we have a choice. We can go home, return, go south, or we can go north. Which will it be? And without missing a beat, the fair sister says, north. Let's go north. So they get back in that ship and off they go. They start sailing north. And Tatterhood is pretty good with this ship thing. She can steer it. She's got the sails up and the goats tethered to the mast and off they go. <laughs> and they're riding north and north. And who knows? We don't know how long they went. They kept going north and they'd pull, pull into little fjords from time to time and, and harvest berries and nuts and mushrooms and whatever plants they could find. It said they hunted rabbits and squirrels. We don't really know how they did it, but they did it. They traveled for a few years, maybe three years, four years, 10 years. Who knows? They kept going north, kept going north. Until one day, they arrived at a port. And Tatterhood steered the ship in to the port. And some of the king's men from that kingdom, wherever that was, rode up to meet them. Well, they didn't get many visitors that far up north. And so they were curious, who is this lady? a ship with a goat and it's this wooden spoon 
or and so they talked to Tata Hood and Tata Hood and they demanded to see all the people on the ship because they they suspected an attack maybe there was an army hiding below um, and Tata Hood refused she said only when the king comes to greet us shall I show you all the people on the ship so surprisingly, the king's men fell for this. <laughs> they brought the king and he came out to the ship and he met with Tatterhood. And then she brought her sister out, who by now, was, she was looking a lot better. The, the scarring was, was almost gone. The bruising was definitely gone. She's looking a lot better in the neck. Um, and the king invited them over to his, his castle and said he would prepare a feast to welcome them. And indeed he did. Big, beautiful feast lots of fruit and vegetables and meat and wine and they sat in the grand hall of the king's castle and they heard his story and they saw his grief for his lady queen had died a few years before and he was heavy with grief his heart was heavy and he had two two wonderful sons and they gave him much joy but still he was he was heavy with grief and the sisters decided this was a good place to stay for a while. They'd be traveling for a long time and they were tired. The ship could use a bit of work. And so they decided to stay. And as they stayed, they would, the fair sister found herself wandering in the afternoons, walking along the, the beach with the king, talking, getting to know each other. Until eventually one afternoon, the king came to Tatterhood and he said, Tatterhood, come to ask you for the hand of your sister in marriage. And Tatterhood says, older sisters marry first. Root me with your, your, your son, a double wedding, it shall be. The king was concerned. Oh no, I don't know what my son's gonna think of this. So he said, okay, let me go find out Tatterhood. And he galloped off back to the castle. And he talked to his son and he explained the situation and he explained his love for the fair sister and how much joy this would bring him to marry her. And the son said, dear father, I have seen you in so much grief these past few years and I have felt this grief too. And I see this glimmer now, this glimmer in your eyes and this swelling in your heart. And I, I love to see this and I want to support you, dear father. I'll absolutely, anything you need to bring this happiness into your life, anything you need, I'll absolutely marry Tatterhood. And so it was to be. The wedding was prepared. And on the morning of the wedding, the king and the son came to pick up the, the two ladies from their ship. And they were riding beautiful horses and their manes were all plaited and rubies and sapphires and diamonds were wound into their, their bridles and they were dressed in their finest. And they brought a beautiful horse for the fair sister for her to jump on. And well, Tatterhood had her goat, so she didn't need a horse. And so the four of them set off to the chapel to get married. And the king and the, the fair sister were riding in front and behind them, the prince, who was feeling a little concerned, and Tatterhood on her goat. And they were in, they were in silence. The king and the, the fair sister were chatting away, uh, but Tatterhood and the prince were in silence for a lot of the way until she turned to him and she said, why do men never ask the questions that open a woman's soul? And the prince was, hmm, I don't know. What are those questions? And Tatterhood said, well, if I tell you the questions that will open my soul, will you ask them of me? Oh yes, absolutely, of course. He was a very sweet prince. So Tatterhood said, the first question is, why do you ride a goat? So the, the prince asked, well, yeah, why do you ride a goat? And she said, to those with eyes to behold, this is no goat. This is a Castilian steed. And indeed, when the prince looked back, he saw this beautiful brown horse with a beautiful bridle and its mane all plaited. And I don't know where the goat had gone, but he saw this beautiful horse. And he said, what other questions should I ask you? She said, well, what about asking me why do you carry a wooden spoon? Well, absolutely, why do you carry that wooden spoon? 
Because, dear Prince, for those with eyes to behold, this is no wooden spoon, this is a Rowan wand. And indeed, as he looked again, the most beautiful, slender Rowan wand was held in her hand. Well, that's quite a thing. What other questions should I ask? And she said, well, how about you ask me, why do you wear that tattered old hood all the time? Yeah, that's a great question. Why do you wear that tattered old hood all the time? And she said, well, for those with eyes to behold, this is no tattered hood. This is a crown of antlers and dog roses. And indeed, as he looked back, he saw this beautiful crown. The hood was gone. Her hair was cascading down her back. And as he looked over at her in the sunlight, into her ordinary face, into her brown eyes. He knew, he knew that this was a love that would last their whole lives. That's the end. <laughs> so I am going to do some Zoom magic here and uh, send you off into, into breakout rooms. So you'll have a chance to, you'll be with, depending on my math here, you'll be with some other number of people, smaller group. Let me see, let me do like eight rooms. So that you can take a little bit of time to reflect on this part amongst yourselves because it's in the, in the large group, we don't all get to speak. Um, so you'll be in a group of three, four, five, some number of people. Um, take a moment to just reflect on this last part of the, of the story and think about your wild twin and think about how your wild twin is expressed and maybe it's not expressed and what do you need more of to help it be expressed and how do you find that balance? What helps you find that balance? Um, so maybe about 10, 15 minutes we'll spend in the small groups and uh, you'll be able to message me if you need anything or have questions and then we'll come back all together and I'd love to hear from some of you what you're what you're feeling what's moving inside of you okay so you're gonna disappear into another room and you can always leave the room and come back if you don't want to be in the room welcome back welcome back people are flying in from all corners of the virtual world so yeah i'd love to hear from you anybody that feels called just unmute yourself and Tell us some of the things you may discuss in the group. Maybe don't reveal any personal information, but some of the themes that came out of your discussion or things that are feeling that are emerging out of this for you. Because remember, whatever each of us are going to process this differently, whatever's singing in you may not be singing in others, but it also may be. And so hearing it from you can help someone else gain more clarity of what is that, what is that thing I'm feeling here? What is this thing that's moving inside of me? So by sharing what's what's moving in you, you're you're creating more medicine for others. Let's hear just something. Something must have moved. Um, okay. Oh. Go ahead, Devin. Yes. Um, yeah, I'll jump in. It was I just found it very interesting. Our group was so wrapped up in this story of the wild one and her twin. Um, and then we, I guess towards the end there, we remembered the fact that the sisters in the beginning, uh, not sisters really, but the two children in the beginning, um, you know, where did they go? Where did they end up? <laughs> But um, just like the wild one and the you know domesticated one are sort of twins um, and mirror images of each other, I just felt it interesting that this whole story was birthed really through the connection at the beginning of this adopted niece um, who found this you know wild reflection maybe of herself uh, over the hedge and sort of made this connect that led to all of these events unfolding just sort of wondered about them towards the end where are they now 
Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, the story doesn't tell us what happens to those two, but obviously their their themes are carried through. Um, yeah, and I've wondered that myself, like just that, you know, the one person in the kingdom that said, well, what about adopting a niece? You know, that, that then created this whole thing. This whole thing wouldn't have happened without that one little twist going in a different direction. Um, hi, we talked about... Hi. We talked about the um, the end, and um, we what I realized for myself, or what I kind of saw in the ending in the conversation with the couple was that he um, he he kind of just said yes to his father out of love, and he didn't really he didn't have any resistance. He's just his heart was so open to his father, he said yes. And then um, when he was matched, he was able to see in the, in the, his partner, the beauty that was there that all the others could not see. Mm -hmm. So I just felt so um, immersed in like his faith kind of carried him through to this place where he was, he was blessed with even more than he could have imagined. And I felt resonant with that in my own life with that experience it was really cool. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. And, uh, and Tata Hood uses, she's very specific in her language. She uses the word, the phrase for those who have the eyes to behold and this world word behold right and we've heard that phrase you know beauty is in the eye of the beholder but to, to behold to be held is is that that's what you're speaking to this ability that the prince to be open-hearted to, to hold her and all of her everything all of who she is to be able to hold that is what helped transform her or transform his perception of her however you want to interpret it yeah thank you What other parts of singing? There was a saying I heard the other day, um, the universe bends towards love and justice. Mm. And I uh, felt like that was the reward of the, the son, um, of that kind of unconditional love for his father mm. and how he was rewarded with being able to see all of this new bride that no one else could see it's almost like a kind of karmic uh reward of sorts <laughs> quite enjoyed right right and to find this like full person this person who was a uh, she had all of this she had this wildness and the crashing about on a goat um but then there's this other side of her as well she's like a fully rounded human that he gets to gets to be with um, yeah, and it also makes me think Hazel of the of the fair sister, as she was called throughout the story, the younger sister, um, that this started on her on her debut night when she was being presented to all these suitors who she didn't even know. And this whole journey took her to a place where she found she found love and she was able to marry for love, not for duty or responsibility, which had been her fate before that and had her mother maybe as someone else pointed out not eaten that red flower maybe the ogres and the witches wouldn't have come and you know it all wouldn't have unfolded that way what else what about reflections on your own wild twin and and what are the where are the places that 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 part of you gets to be expressed or isn't getting to be expressed and you're aware that it needs to be expressed what have you found that helps to balance that between your domesticated self and your, your wild self? Hi, Kat um, and everyone. I was just saying to my group, um, to group seven, that um, because I have been basically ignoring this message for quite some time, <laughs> um, I've actually seem to have manifested um, physical uh, wild people in my life mm -hmm. uh, to teach me the lesson. Um, yeah. And I was, in fact, um, I was also saying that just before this um, webinar, I was listening, uh, sorry, reading, reading um, an, an email about esoteric astrology. I, I quite, 
I, I follow astrology a bit just as an amateur. And this um, particular email um, just, you know, drew me to it for some reason. And I was reading the contents. And um, it's funny how these things happen. Obviously, it was meant to be. So it was sort of synchronistic. So I'm reading this article about how um, the um, uh, Taurus takes us to, you know, the, the bullseye, which is sort of our earthy, uh, real self and uh, that and once we've been through that process then we can um, it turns into the sun so the bullseye becomes our sun and in astrology the sun is you know the light we're meant to shine in the world etc and I was ruining the fact the other day that my my sun is um, being blocked at the moment so in other words I can't shine my my soul light and because it's conduct myself, no, this is all very technical, but basically the South is relevant, right? Because the South is the past. And I did have a, you know, a happy marriage and everything was lovely. And then I had this wild daughter come into my life and I ended up getting divorced recently. And um, my life has been completely turned upside down. I've gone North, literally, into the wild, literally. <laughs> um, well, not quite. It's the outskirts of the city and it's a beach and bush and everything. Um, and, uh, and so... Uh, I'm looking at my astrology chart. It says my sun is blocked. I'm, it, my north node is now in Taurus, north in Taurus, calf's head, bull. <laughs> um, and, um, and so this message, the message from the story to me, and given the synchronicities involved, I'm reading, a book, I'm reading an email telling me all about Taurus and the sun and I'm, you know, in this quandary about my life being stuck. And, and it's a story and it's talking about going north and it's a process and at the end it will all be good providing you embrace your wild side first right mm -hmm. um and and these wild people in my life and uh you know my daughter who has been teaching me lessons since she was born 13 years ago and I have you know like a wild soul twin who's come into my life um who you know is <laughs> teaching me lessons as well and and I'm being presented constantly with potential suitors who I'm like oh, just go away I don't want these people in my life um so to me, it's a very synchronistic thing um, that this has appeared in my personal life. Um, it has given me a message, and I think to everyone it will be a slightly different message, but to me, north means, you know, your true north, your compass, your true north, you're meant to be doing that. South is the past, and, you know, symbolically that is what it is in astrology too. So um, it, it, to me it's saying if you need to embrace your wild twin, your wild aspect, your Mars, your, your instinctual self before you can become a whole and healed person and live a happy life. Right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Marianne. That's beautiful to hear how that's weaving its way through your life specifically. Yeah. And as you said at the beginning, I think everyone will receive it differently. And I, I think that everyone um, uh, will find there a different means of embracing their wild self in my case it's actually physical people mm -hmm. um that i'm as well as i mean physical people that will lead to my ability to embrace my own wild side they're, they're showing me aspects i think we're all given mirrors in life and these people are mirrors to what i'm my shadow the shadow that i'm hiding away um is being personified for me so i can see it um, but you're quite right. I think art is a, another possibility. I actually also sort of mentioned this that I, I think the kingdom metaphor is that this, these are our, you know, going along the, not exactly astrology, but um, people like Caroline Meiss talk about archetypes and Carl Jung and his archetypes. And I, and I think the kingdom is symbolic of our, our round table of knights. It's our, it's our um, kingdom of archetypes, the different aspects to ourselves that come in and out of our lives. And they don't always sit at the table, but we have different archetypes that come at different times to teach us or to lead us or to guide us. Or maybe they won't get out of the kingdom because they're there, they stay too long. And the king and queen were obviously part of that picture. Um, but the interesting, the niece, the adopted niece is interesting. And I, and I, to me, that I read that as being an external force, an external something beyond ourselves comes mm -hmm. in to trigger, to comes in to activate something within us so that we can continue on our journey. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much. That's okay. Yeah. Jerry. I felt it was so interesting in the story how the, um, the, the coveted one was this precious, more innocent, younger, um, sister and um 
the the wild one was indeed um, dignified and beautiful and magical. She had a wand and a crown and a horse, and um, that was that was hidden from sight until um, until the 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 beholder was worthy of beholding. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think reflecting on my own story. Um, there's something like reversed in that with me where um, the what's on the outside is um, the 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 facade of the of the the innocent and disciplined one mm -hmm. and what gets revealed to one who is worthy is the wild one mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I guess I'm working in, uh, I guess, cross current to this narrative that I um, am somehow, somehow domesticated mm -hmm. um, because I study things, because I, because I, um, join because I join in in organizing and I am rooted in a place and have commitment to a sense of place and not just like a free spirit would just have no home just be wandering and um, following impulses and um, that there is something in fact alive and wild in that sense of place and in that commitment to community and justice and um, it's perhaps not seen by those who are unworthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautifully put, Jerry, thank you. Yeah, that's that's very much how I, the story has worked in me is, you know, there's that yearning, I said this earlier, to, to wanna be the wild one, to wanna be the free spirit, to just up and leave. And I've done that in my life. I've blown up relationships and just left and literally moved to another country or moved to another state and just been like, <laughs> I'm like gone. Um, and that's, yeah. And then I've learned from that, um, that there's that temptation, that wanting to just like, forget it, throw away all of civilization, all of the domestication. And just like, let me just live out in the woods. Literally I wanted to live out in the woods and eat what I find and just like live like that. And I've had this yearning and I know I'm not the only one with our very domesticated lives. Um, and ultimately for me, that's not the answer. I know it's not because I'm, I'm here. The soul is here in this body at this time with a purpose. And that purpose involves my community, involves my country, involves the planet. And that me living in a cave in the woods is not gonna allow me to fulfill that purpose. So how do I bring that, that wild one, that one that wants to be out in the woods and wants to be feral and, and to be able to express that, how do I bring that into the responsibilities I have in my life, whether it's running my business, whether it's in my activism, whether it's in my writing, like how do I bring that in so that I can be more like Teta Hood at the end as she's fully beheld? How can I have both of those parts working? in me um, and not necessarily vying for power within me but but integrated and 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 expressing fully expressed and acknowledged and and that's a constant question i'm not saying i have the answer to that that is a constant question that i'm asking how can i bring these parts of myself um, because certainly for me and i think probably for most of us in this culture we are the domesticated one is is the one that gets the attention that's that's sort of how we're trained and how we're raised um, and this story, remember, the story is very old. This is not a modern problem that we've lost our wildness, right? This is this process of our domestication has been going on for thousands of years. This is an old story. So this is something that the, the wise ones have been working with for a long, long time. And it keeps playing out. So how do we now in this time and this place in the way that the world is now, how do we bring these two things into integration within ourselves and within our communities? And how do we recognize these, the wild one, the domesticated one in our children, in our partners, in our friends? And, and how do the two of them interact with each other is a whole nother question in my life. 
seeing some things in the, the chat. Yeah, Sharon Blackie, absolutely. Love her books. Seal Skin, yeah, from, yeah. Uh, Clarissa Pinkola Estes is another woman who gathers these stories and then speaks on them beautifully. Any other thoughts? Well, I do want to say something, that, Marianne, that you said that reminded me that often the kingdom, you can interpret these stories in so many ways, but often certainly in the Celtic mythology, the kingdom is, is a symbol of the entire, of the land, of the, of the, of the, the entire land. Um, and so how do these things play out within the kingdom and how does the, the grief or the health of the, the king and the queen, which is often the, the bringing together of the masculine and the feminine, how does that play out in the actual land and the health of the trees and the water and the soil? You can also sort of go to that level with it. Like what is it we need to do as a culture to allow our wildness back in um, so that we can be more in tune with the planet and that with the actual land and, and be more in balance with how we're in interaction with the land. So there's a, there's a whole nother layer of that. Yeah, in fact, um, Kate, I'd also say that um, it, there's also the element of us being healed by the land. Mm -hmm. And because we're so divorced from nature, um, we actually made ourselves sick. Yeah. We have, yeah. So I, I, my understanding is that this time in the planet well not so much in the planet's evolution but in our evolution even we we need to reconnect with the earth as a means of healing because that literally the the microbiome in the um in the soil will actually help us all heal so it's a mm -hmm. it's a timely reminder that we need to get our hands dirty <laughs> yeah um, something something i would never do i would never put my hands in the soil it's disgusting but now I belong to a community garden and my hands are in the soil every week. So nice. there you go. And there's some research that came out a couple of years back um, where they sort of identified the bacteria that is in soil that has exactly. an exactly. impact on our immune system. I don't remember the mechanism exactly, but yeah. just breathing eat. that in, it boosts our immune system. Oh, and they say that little children should actually eat dirt, literally, right. because, <laughs> because of that. Because of the, In fact, I ran into a... Um, uh, she she was actually a nutritionist, and I had a dog with me, and, and um, the dog was licking the her two year old, and I said, "Oh, I'm sorry, the dog likes to lick." And she said, "Don't worry about it." She said, "We've there's studies that have shown that that people who live with dogs have much healthier gut biome." Oh. So they, you know, we need to be dirty. <laughs> that's good. I spent a significant amount of my childhood making mud pies, so that's good. Oh yes, yeah, so did I. <laughs> <laughs> Um, any other final thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Katie. Go, go ahead, Grace. You're good. Me? Yeah. Um, okay. It's simple, but just just the idea or what happens in the story that the wild that the two twins love each other. Mm. That they are like they are they bounce off of each other. They like feed each other. That's different than I think I've been going through a process recently where they're kind of like I sort of feel like they need to battle or I'm like, is it this, I have to choose one over the other. Um, like, yeah, either I'm choosing my wild and like negating society or choosing like the society and am I losing the wild? So it's, it's just nice to hear that simple, you know, simple reminder that they really can complement each other and like bring life to each other and they need each other. And so that's just a simple, but good reminder for me. Beautiful. Thank you. Grace, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, um, I just want to say don't don't put down the domesticated twin, you know, yeah. either in general or within yourselves. Because um, yeah. what I like to tell people is that whatever beautiful medicine you're here to deliver, you're going to have a hard time doing it if you can't remember to wear pants in public. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the, the domesticated part of ourselves, the social self, the, the <laughs> ego, the everyday middle world rational mind is very necessary when it's in partnership to whatever is more essential and more primal. Absolutely, beautifully said. Yes, yeah, this is about an integration. It's not about exiling either one of them. It's about an integration. And often, you know, the pendulum swings like this. So if you've done a lot of the domestic one, it can be tempting to go and do a lot of the wild one, but eventually you're sort of gonna come back into a place where they're, where they're integrated. Um, and that, that is really what the, what as a organization we do at Rites of Passage Council is, is creating these ceremonies 
and experiences to help people become more in connection with all the different parts of ourselves and, and working towards reintegrating them. And we didn't spend, it, no one sort of brought up this point in the story, but I want to highlight it, where the fair sister's head is hanging on a rusty nail in a long house full of hags, which is essentially like she's there, like what is her head seeing? She has gone through, she's already, we know that there was this big initiation and she's disappeared off, her head is gone. Um, but the story doesn't go into what did she see? What did she hear? What did she learn while she was hanging on that rusty nail in that house of witches? But she comes out, but we do know that when she comes out and she gets put back on her body, that she makes a choice that probably we weren't expecting. She doesn't choose to go home. She chooses to take a journey. So she must have seen and heard and experienced some things that changed her. Um, and that, that's really what the, some of the work that we're doing at the at Rites of Passage Council is about, is about creating those experiences, listening to that calling, somebody brought that up earlier, and being willing to step into, step off the path that has been prescribed into something unknown, going through it, ex that experience of who knows what it is that she saw and heard. And I think it's important that the story doesn't tell us that, but we know that something happened and she comes out the other side of it different and makes a different choice. So I do want to, before we go, just Al my friend Alistair here is going to post a couple of um, links in the chat for you um, about some, some other things that we're doing at Rites of Passage Council. We are going to be doing two more storytelling events. I think the next one is the beginning of March, like the first week in March, and then there's another one that, that Kate is going to be leading. And then there's another one right at the end of March that I'm going to be leading, which is going to be a, an Irish story on a similar, similar theme. Um, so there's, there's those two more storytelling events coming up and then the, the links that Alice just posted are one for um, Vision Quest, we're doing three uh, Vision Quests this year, um, all of them will be here in close to Asheville, North Carolina, which is that classic initiation that rites of passage, uh, where we get you all together and send you out, we don't quite send you out to a, a long house of hags, but it's, everyone is a, it's a choose your own adventure. So it's sort of up to you what happens when you're out there. Um, so that that's one of the things that, that will be happening this year. Um, and I'm also facilitating, oh, and there's one in Spain. Thank you, Kate. Um, and then I'm facilitating two uh, weekend programs. It's called the, Wo the Road Ahead and Awakening the Wild Heart, where we'll be exploring this theme a lot more and that that'll be a Friday through Sunday and there's two of those one in May and the other one I think is in October again in the Asheville North Carolina area so if you want to go deeper into into this um, then then those are some opportunities for you coming up this year does anyone have any last minute questions comments anything you want to say you're welcome I'll just add one one comment about the hags. It may or may not be true, but it, for what it's worth to consideration, um, the idea of the um, the the cycles of the feminine, the divine feminine's evolution, you know, from the maiden to the mother to the hag or to the crone. So it could well be that 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 was symbolic. That you know, she she had it was the end of her of that cycle in her life being the domesticated one. That and and she had to hang that up. Um, before she could begin her new life as yeah. the maiden again. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah. And then it was the elders, the hags, who were her guides in that, although they were unexpected guides. <laughs> they were. Yeah. Her. And that is, and that is the role, of course, of, yeah. the, of the hag, of the crone, where mm -hmm. those of us who, are, you know, at that stage of our lives are meant to be the guides for our younger, uh, younger women. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Any other thoughts? I was just going to add, because um, we were talking about the integration of, you know, feeling like sometimes you have to make a choice. And I think it's so important on on all of these things to remember, um, no, you don't. It's and, you know, and, and Grace sort of spoke to that as well, that it's we embrace all of our sides and it doesn't have to be, well, if I'm that, I can't be that. And and just remembering not to get lost in one or the other or to especially the wild side to go in as escapism you know we we learn what we're supposed to learn to bring back to to these current dimensions that we are in 
um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who has been in those situations where you go, I, I don't want to go back. I really like it out here, but that's not what we were sent here to do. So um, I'll just leave it with that. And this has been wonderful. And I thank you, Kat. It was just really great. Yeah. Thank you for joining us all the way from Canada. Yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts before we close? Thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate your your time and your attention and all your thoughts being willing to to share your medicine is important as well so it's not just me talking um, hey, can i just ask you what the name of the formal name of the story is thank the you. Yes, i didn't i didn't notice it. it's called tatterhood um and oh, okay. i learned it from martin shore i don't know how many of you know martin shore he's a wonderful storyteller mythologist from devon in england um if you're just looking up Dr. Martin Shore mythologist, he'll come up on Google. He's got a wonderful video of him telling this story live and he, he's amazing. He does an amazing job. It would be well worth watching. And also his book, Courting the Wild Twin, has this story, Tatterhood, and another story called The Lindworm, which is different, similar on the same theme and well worth digging into. Thank you all so much. I know some of you, it's the middle of the night for you, you and you're still here. <laughs> I appreciate you holding on with us. And uh, yeah, many blessings for your evening and your, your week ahead as we move into this new part of the year. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.